And uh, this is a quote. This is a quote. He says, at all events, anyone with even a nodding acquaintance with the Rubik Cube will concede the near impossibility of a solution being obtained by a blind person moving the cubic faces at random. Now imagine 10 to the 50th power of blind persons. By the way, 10 to the 50th power is a number that scientists accept as being impossible, and that, that high a number um, of a probability occurring by chance if you've got 1 out of 10 to the 50th power. And so he's saying that's the number of blind persons, each with a scrambled Rubik cube. And he says, try to conceive of the, of the chance of them all simultaneously arriving at the solved form. And the solved form is 10 billion times a billion possible different uh, interfaces in the Rubik's Cube. So 10 billion billion, all 10 to the 50th power of blind people fiddle around with these Rubik's Cubes. That's about the chance of life. He says, you then have the chance of arriving by random shuffling of just one of the many biopolymers, proteins on which life depends. The notion that not only the biopolymers but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial soup here on Earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Life must be plainly a cosmic phenomenon. And what Gramasinghe went on to say that he believes that there's a creation now because th there's no evidence for th the scientific there's, evidence. There's no, no other goes explanation. Against it. Yeah. Yeah, this, this really is a matter of faith from the side of, of atheism and evolutionism. If you're going to remove an intelligent creator, one who is not only wise enough to do this, but powerful enough to do this. So we're clearly talking about God. If you remove God from the picture, the only option are, are these insanely high numbers, these in, in incredible odds against all this happening. But they have to believe that is what happened if you remove God from the picture. So it, it really is a matter of faith. Um, yeah, one of the things that uh, I find fascinating with this, uh, and, and this actually makes this a lot worse. Uh, I don't know if Sir is going to talk about this, but uh, in the course of, well, when we do this in the labs, when we you know, mix chemicals and, and try to come up with some of these things uh, in, in, in the labs and such, a lot of the byproducts, a lot of the things that the chemicals mix and produce that we don't really want them to, that's not what we're looking for, but a lot of these byproducts are actually, they inhibit the products that we want, so they make it worse. So if you take this back to natural setting, primordial soup, or what have you, and these things randomly mixing, and let's say they're coming up with about the same random mix of chemicals that we're finding in our labs, well, there you've got all of these chemicals, maybe a few of them are useful, but you've got so many more that inhibit or destroy the useful ones. So the odds are, are even worse than the ones that we're, that we're talking about here. The numbers are, are so much greater if we really want to look at, at all the factors. It's just, it's just incredible to believe that, that uh, you know, these are, these are professional scientists. The quote that he gave, uh, that, that he gave, uh, I don't remember the journal that it came from, but he had a website at the bottom. It was a website from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This is a, a very prestigious group of scientists, very, uh, very highly, you know, seen in, in scientific communities. And yet they were suggesting that, uh, uh, this, this author was suggesting that natural selection could account for, for these things coming about, these, these random chemicals. And one of the points he makes is that the chemicals cannot come about, I'm sorry, natural selection cannot come about until you have life. Because in, in, in natural selection, you have to have generation after generation slowly changing, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. But natural, uh, natural selection, natural processes will weed out the, the, the less fit and the more fit will survive and pass on their beneficial traits to future generations. But you need this process of, of reproduction and generations to get natural selection. So before you have the first cell, you have no reproduction, you cannot have natural selection. And yet he suggested this, and, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Science published it, um, and it's, it's, it's a really a meaningless uh, um, excuse is, is what it is. It won't work. And he's talking about 256 enzymes, which are basically proteins. Analytic uh, proteins. And, and the average protein size is about a chain of over 300 amino acids. They're, they're typically hundreds. And he's saying, let's say we've got 10 of the amino acids out of the 
two or three hundred or whatever for each of the of being the very generous. It, it very generous. It's usually about a hundred uh, that have to be in fixed places, exact places. You know, it's utterly impossible. And these things are needed for life because they speed up processes that are necessary for life millions and millions of times. So besides the pro, you know, where, where are you going to get all this? It's utterly impossible. You know, and the proof for God in Isaiah 41, 21 through 23, God says, if you're God, show it by telling the future. And he means that by 100% accurately. And he repeats himself three times there. And he says, show it by telling the future. And he says, there is no other one but me, and I'm going to do it. And so we have Iran right now, which is a major enemy of Israel. And the Bible says that after Israel comes back as a nation, that Iran is going to be at the focal point with the country furthest most north of the Black Sea, which is Russia, which in the Bible, in the King James, it, the, the pronunciation is Rosh, uh, and uh, Tobolsk is, is there too. Um, and it states that that country, Russia basically, is going to be allied with Iran in the last days after Israel is brought back as a nation. Persia. Exactly. Allied with Persia. Exactly. And what do we see today? That's exactly what we see today. And then it adds in a, num a number of other countries, the Northern African countries, and says they're going to be involved too against Israel in the latter days after Israel has been scattered for many, many years out of the land of Israel. The land would go waste. And when they come back, it says that the land is going to bloom, which it has. And it was waste. As you start to look at these prophecies, and they're never wrong, for those of us that want truth, like for me, Brandon, I, you know, you know, I, I looked at the world at growing up. I wasn't a believer or anything. I had rejected God at around the age of 12 because of seeing the evil in the Holocaust and stuff like that coming from a Jewish background. I said, if there was a God, you know, why didn't he stop all the killing of these innocent people? I'd see these films of people being bulldozed into pits and in the end of World War II, and it's women and children, and I, how could there be a God of love and allow all that, I felt. But later I found that it was because of mankind's sin that these things have occurred, that God has given us the free will to check things out and decide whether we want to look for him to see if there's meaning in life, or is it just random, like random cells, coming about through chemicals. That's about the only other alternative, either random that way or an intelligence. Some people like to combine the two, but the Bible doesn't, doesn't when you really study it, doesn't really allow for that too well. We can talk about that if you're interested, if someone calls in about that. We've talked about it before. So God says, I'm going to tell the future 100% accurately. And this blew me away. And, and later I found that Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Robert Boyle, they became believers just the same way that it solidified it for me. They said, there's no way these prophecies could have come about by chance, Brandon. And you were brought up in a Christian household, but I, I'm sure you've spent time looking at these prophecies. And, and you, you probably had, you know, human beings, we all have doubts at times and say, well, how do I know for sure? And you wake up in the morning and you've got to gather your thoughts. Who am I? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did grow up in a Christian home, but uh, for me, you, you've come from, uh, you've looked into a lot of a lot of religions, Eastern religions and cults and things like that. For me, a lot of the the not so much straying, but I, I guess the journey, I guess the the wondering and investigating came came through science, through you know modern humanism, secular secular science, and that kind of thing. Um, I. Uh, I grew up loving science. I've studied science uh, for as long as I can remember. And of course, you, you go to the science books and you go through public schools, which I did, and they teach and teach and teach evolution. This is the way it is. There was no God involved, etc. And so that clearly conflicted with, with what I read out of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that was a, something that I had to, to investigate, and I've spent... Uh, well, nearly nine years now, um, really digging into this. I, I've devoted my, my life, I suppose you could say, to, to this particular investigation. And, uh, and I've also looked into apologetics. I've just come to love the, the Bible and the history and, and just scholarship in general. I have looked at apologetics and, and, and the history, archaeology, and things like that.